Good morning. Happy to see you all at church today. And thank you for being with us on this second Sunday of Easter. And we'd like to welcome those who are participating online this morning. Thank you for being part of this worship service. As you are able, we invite you to stand for the call to worship. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you will renew the face of the earth. Amen. Let us now pray together the prayer that is in the bulletin. Light of the world, shine upon us with your Holy Spirit Gather in our midst that we might know you are truly here. Guide us in unity and love that we might be a blessing of unity and love for the world. Amen. The first hymn is Praise to the Lord the Almighty, number 139 in the Red Hymnal. 139 in the Red Hymnal. I invite you to turn to page 12 in the Red Hymnal for the invitation, confession, and pardon. Today we are celebrating the sacrament of communion, and everyone is invited to the table of the Lord. 
this is not the table of the United Methodist Church. It's not even the table of this local congregation. It is a table of our Lord Jesus Christ, who invites all to come and receive his grace. Page 12. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your law. We have not loved our neighbor. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let us confess our personal sins in silence. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, Hear the good news. Christ died for us when we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. I invite you now, as you are able, to stand for more hymns of praise and worship. The first one is In Christ Alone. That's in the green hymnal, number 3105. Thank you.
You may be seated. We would like to send greetings to those participating online this morning. Uh, good morning to Dan Nieto, uh, Roland Tafoya and family, uh, Juan Solis, uh, Mary, Bill, and Maya in Laredo, and also um, good morning to Hermana Susie Ponce, who joins us every Sunday at, at this hour. Some announcements will be on the screen. Uh, tonight, um, the Hispanic churches in San Antonio, the United Methodist Churches, um, Hispanic churches are having our Culto Unido, and that's at Emanuel UMC at 5 p.m. Everyone is welcome to participate and be part of this uh, Culto Unido. Our Monday soup and study will continue, uh, will resume next week on the 15th, and we gather at 11.30, and then the study begins at noon. You can also join through Zoom. The ID and the passcode are on the screen. You can also uh, connect with me if you would like the, um, the link, and I'll send it to you. Our Wesley nurse, Marta Eck, is um, signing people up for a senior adult fall prevention class, and there's still spaces uh, for this class, as she's hoping that enough people will sign up so that, um, that a time and a starting date will be, um, will be determined. Uh, please connect with Marta. Her phone numbers are on the screen and, and on the bulletin, and this is a very good class um, for senior adults uh, to increase your confidence, your strength, and balance uh, to help you um, decrease your, your fear of falling. So it's a very good class and highly recommended. We continue our ministry with uh, Cooper Academy. And our church supports 11 student families that are attending classes at Cooper Academy. And we provide uh, non-perishable food items to these families um, who don't have access to, to school lunches during three-day weekends. Our next collection date is April 24th, and you can, you can bring uh, the food items any time between now and then, and we will uh, collect those and, and send them over to, to, um, to Cooper Academy uh, the, uh, after April 24th. This season of Easter, uh, you may give additional offerings to your regular giving in celebration of what God has done for us in Christ. These additional offerings help our church meet our yearly budget. Uh, thank you so much for your generosity, and you're welcome to use the uh, special envelopes or simply uh, write an additional amount and note it as Easter offering um, if you're using your an envelope, another envelope. Thank you so much for your generosity. So what did you think you'd like to thank everyone that provided these beautiful lilies for our sanctuary? And a reminder, if you did purchase uh, some lilies and were unable to take them home last week, please take them home today. Uh, or if you see somebody's name, maybe you can deliver it to that person. Thank you again. Yes, yes thank you for, um, for giving glory to God uh, through the beautiful lilies and uh, thank you for participating with that. Um, we will now go to um, the offering. So I would like the ushers to come forward at this time, and then Jeremiah is going to help us with the offering plates. Let us pray. Loving God, we are so thankful to you for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we have comes from you. And Lord, today we give to you our lives, and we also give to you our, our gifts. Um, Lord, the scriptures say, say that 
you bless the cheerful giver. And we give in cheerfulness and in gratitude. Multiply these offerings for your glory so that the people around this church and beyond will know that Jesus loves them. We pray this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. remain standing for the prayer for illumination and the reading of the scriptures. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture this morning is from 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will, you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Did anybody get it? Yeah. <laughs> the eclipse. Our message today is titled The Fellowship of Experience. And uh, I want to begin asking, I mean, we're dressed like this in homage to the eclipse, if you're wondering. So she's my sunshine, and she's brilliant and wonderful, and I'm just all in shadows. 
So here we are. Uh, do y'all have plans to try to see it? Right? Good. Yeah, we're my son Victor, who's here from out of town. Victor's here from Wisconsin today. Hi, Victor. Uh, we're going to drive out to the Hill Country if we can make it uh, tonight. Raquel, this will be here. We live in the part of town where the totality is. But um, the eclipse is one. They're saying everybody should try to watch it because it's a once in a lifetime or maybe twice in a lifetime experience. And it's an experience that helps create uh, a kind of common experience among all of us who live on planet Earth and can look up into the celestial realm and see something beautiful that maybe there's no other chance to see. The coming of the eclipse has uh, brought back some memories for me that are, that are kind of precious. I went back and looked at my old videos from 1991. Uh, there was a solar total eclipse in Mexico City in 1991. And while I wasn't in Mexico City, I wasn't far from there. I was in Monterrey that summer. And so we were watching a 97% uh, or 98% eclipse in Monterrey. Uh, and I was living at the Methodist headquarters and, uh, and because I had just graduated from science at UT Austin, I, I made them uh, kind of a solar observatory thing out of a mirror and a pinhole and a piece of cardboard and, and projected the eclipse inside their offices so that they could watch it on the wall. They could watch a projection of the arc of the sun going across uh, during the eclipse. And then we had a television set and we're watching the broadcast from Mexico City where everybody was uh, standing in the Zocalo and watching to up to the skies. The scripture today is about experience. It's about the fact that our faith, our Christian faith, is, is grounded in experience. And that is largely what we're professing when we talk about Easter and the resurrection. It's, it's a faith that is in response to something God has done, a miracle that God has done in raising Jesus from the dead and having Jesus appear to the disciples. The gospel story today is the story of Thomas's encounter with, with Jesus. You all know that story where the first time Thomas wasn't there and the second time he was. Uh, people call him Doubting Thomas. I just call him Church Skipping Thomas because the first Sunday he wasn't there, he missed seeing Jesus. I mean, be careful what Sunday you choose to be out because you never know who's going to show up. But um, these experiences like like looking together as a family and seeing an eclipse, seeing something that's so rare and so beautiful and so historic, create a common uh, community among people. And what the scripture writer today is talking about is sharing that experience with others. Think with me uh, of some of the ex groups that you belong to, some of the fellowships that you have that are based on experience. Perhaps you have friends, close friends, uh, close relationships that are based in your work background. So you've been doing some of the same things, working together, collaborating together on projects, on work over the years. You care about some of the same things. You've achieved some of the same goals. You've made some of the same difference together. And because of that, you have a certain fellowship together that other people might not have, right? Pastors have an annual conference for this reason. We love to get together and tell of our stories of the past year and compare notes and compare what worked and what didn't work and how things are going. And so experiences of work together can help form community and create and sustain community. There are experiences of, of particular and unique moments of history like tomorrow's eclipse, but like other things that have happened in history. Perhaps you can remember where you were when certain things happened. I can remember, for example, where I was when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded. I can remember the precise place I was when that happened, that I was a junior in high school. Uh, the history teacher had sent me to the library to bring an audiovisual cart to the classroom so that we could watch the launch. And uh, I was a little late getting to the library and it had already launched. And, and saw it happen live there in the library of the school. I went back to the classroom to tell the class what had happened and no one would believe me. Uh, they thought I was the boy that cried wolf once again. So they uh, didn't want to believe. I remember, you can remember things like that. Moments in history, whether they be good or bad, beautiful or, or tragic, you can remember where you are. And when you find other people that have the same experience, 
you share those stories and you realize, wow, we have a lot in common as our experience has shaped our lives and formed our character and formed who we are and our identity. Our lives can be brought together even through experiences of tragedy and crisis and grief. Um, when you're around folks that have been through some of the same troubles that, that you've suffered and you think, wow, there's empathy here, there's understanding here, there's love and compassion here, there's, there's, uh, there's a, a patience here that's absent in other places where maybe people are judging or not understanding. And so people come together in communities to share their experiences of trauma, of crisis, of grief, because they need that mutual support and the fellowship of experience. There are experiences that unite us around uh, cultural experiences. And this is something we're really proud of and familiar with here at La Trinidad, and that we have things that we share in common with, with one another that are uh, uniting and that are beautiful and it's that we're celebrating we're proud of together the fact that I spent the summer of 1991 and then with that other eclipse I was in Monterrey Mexico when I meet people today from Monterrey or I meet folks from that part of the world there's a certain uh, commonality that we just get to talking and there's there's some stories and some places and we talk about what neighborhood you're from or what place did you like to go hang out there's these experiences of culture. And then, of course, coming back to what the scripture is referring to today, there's the experience of the divine, the experience of God. Now, as Christians, we hold faith in a living God. We hold faith in the God who is an agent of action within human experience and human history. It, God is not merely a, a concept, a personification of some ideology or moral system or, or just a dogma or doctrine, but God is a person, personal God, an agent at work among us. The stories of Easter bring this home as Jesus appears in bodily form to the believers, to his disciples, and reveals to them that he is risen. Some of these appearances in the Easter stories have Jesus appearing in a form that they don't recognize. The Emmaus story, the gardener at the point of the moment of resurrection, the, uh, these people wonder, who is this? Could it be the Lord? And they find out that it is him in the breaking of the bread or in some other thing and hearing his voice, it's revealed that it's Christ. And other times it's obvious to them that it's Jesus and in the Thomas stories, it's Jesus that still has scars from the cross. He has uh, scars in his hands and his side that Thomas can see and observe and experience and be strengthened in his faith because of the experience of a spiritual character. You might be able to share from your own life some experiences that you've had of God that were mystical or wonderful or that caused you to, to reflect on your, on your faith and on the nature of God. Christianity itself is an experiential faith. It is a faith of people who are responding to something God has already done, to the grace, the presence, the work of God. We are a thankful, grateful, joyful people in response to things that God has done, that God took the initiative to save us. God took the initiative to come to us. God gave his life in Christ for us and is raised from the dead to show us that, that our lives have purpose, have eternity waiting for us. Christianity is experiential, but the experiences that Christians have are diverse in nature. It's been a mistake throughout the centuries for churches to say this experience is the way that you prove yourself a Christian if you have had this experience, but not that experience, right? If you've experienced this type of conversion or this emotional experience or you've seen this vision or you've had this uh, particular uh, sign that you've experienced and the scriptures tell us that that's not the case that there are many forms of ways that the Holy Spirit that God manifests God's presence and truth and life and love to us and proves God's self to us the one experience that is universal 
in the Christian faith is the experience of love, the love experience, which is a human experience that we're born with the capacity to do. We all experience God's love, just like everyone that watches the eclipse is going to experience the sun's light. It shines everywhere. It shines on everyone, and God's love is no different. We all experience at some point in our lives a realization of not only God being the God of love, but of God loving us so much that he would go through such immense uh, trouble and means and burden to be able to get our attention, to save us, to redeem us, to restore us to relationship with God. Other experiences that we share with, with many Christians is the experience of conversion. Um, the experience of having a moment in our lives, uh, whether we're born into the church or whether we come in later in life, where we recognize our own responsibility to be faithful disciples, where we recognize our own responsibility to repent and to, to own our faith and to intentionally decide to have Jesus as our Lord, our Savior, our teacher, our friend, and uh, the one who models all of our life. That's conversion. Our conversion experience may be, very, may be varied. It might involve uh, a, a crisis moment or it might be a gradual process, but it involves the same process of coming to a conscious decision to have Christ as our Lord and our Savior. Another experience common to Christians is that of community and of, of the church because Jesus came uh, to unite us together in the body of faith. They come from many nations, many experiences, many backgrounds, many languages, as we read in Acts chapter 2, but form together one community of faith. And it is a community of service, of responsibility, of love, of mutual support, and one in which people can truly refer to each other as hermano, hermana, brother, and sister, as a family of faith with ties and love and relationships that transcend bloodlines and transcend tribes and transcend nationalities and transcend everything else that divides people from each other. It is a community transcending all of those barriers and uniting the human family together in beloved uh, relationship. Another experience that's common to many Christians is the experience of calling, of being called and not necessarily to full-time ministry or to some particular ministry, but recognizing what our gifts and graces that God has given us are meant to be doing in the world, understanding our vocation, understanding our purpose in life. It's a gift from God. God is our creator, and God can reveal to us how it is that we should be spending our time, our talents, uh, our efforts in the world to make a positive difference that helps build up God's purposes and kingdom. So those are things that are experiences of the faith. It's, you can't teach that to someone. You can't indoctrinate somebody with that. You can't say, well, this is, this is, you can't do something to make it happen. These are things that come from a personal walk with Christ, from a personal relationship with the living God. And the writer today of 1 John chapter 1 here in, in part of chapter 2 is referencing experiential faith. Notice what the words are. He says, we declare to you what was from the beginning, meaning this is from eternity from God, what we've heard, what we've seen, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Notice the sensual quality there of the gospel that the writer is professing and sharing with the person reading this letter or hearing this letter. It's something that is experiential. It's, it's multi-sensory. It's real. It exists. It's not merely what we've heard, right? We've, we're just sharing to you what we've heard, but what we've heard and what we've also seen and touched and, and gazed upon. He continues to say, the life that was revealed and we've seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard. Why? So that you may also have fellowship with us. Notice. So what do we see here? Experiences, like I've mentioned, whether they be work, history, 
grief, culture, spirituality can be a tremendous source of community, uni unifying people together and understanding one another. But because of that, those experiences can also set up situations that are quite exclusive. You've probably been in a setting before where people are together and they seem to be talking in a jargon that you don't understand. You've been in that kind of place. Church can be like that. So if I do that up here, if you hear me say some ology word or some ism word or some other thing that doesn't make sense and you think, what does that mean? Please grab me and I'll, give you, I'll, I'll help you with that because I don't want to talk in that way. But there's people that use a lot of jargon, and you know they're all together in their, in their particular thing when they're talking about golf or they're talking about their work or they're talking about the, whatever it is they're doing. Perhaps they're telling inside jokes with each other that they only understand, and they laugh, and they, it's fun, but only they get what it is that they're talking about because that's part of their inside experience that only they have. And the same can be true with culture, and the same can be true with spirituality, in which people begin to uh, set up these kinds of experiences that are exclusive. For example, one such experience in Christianity that can be exclusive is the blessing of being born into and raised in a Christian family. That's something that uh, some people have that other people don't have. Uh, we can't assume that everyone who walks through the doors or is invited or joins us uh, in a place of worship has always been a believer or had a particular type of family background or had a church upbringing or whatever. It's just not there. And so if we assume that everyone does and we're all together and we're all part of the family, we're all children of the church, we all feel we have a certain privilege because of that, it can exclude rather than unite. Same thing can be true of culture. Culture is something rich and beautiful, and our church is especially gifted in its cultural heritage and richness. But the purpose of that is not to set up a wall of exclusion so that only we enjoy these blessings, but so that in turn those experiences can be shared and interpreted and enjoyed by many others. The writer of this text has experienced the risen Christ. The writer of this text has experienced a genuine conversion of faith. The writer of the scripture text today has touched and seen eternal life and doesn't want to keep it to himself, doesn't want to keep it private, doesn't want to create exclusiveness or privilege out of it, but wants it to extend and share with what purpose so that your fellowship can be with him, so that the fellowship can grow, the fellowship can expand. The purpose of these beautiful experiences that God gives us is for us to be transformed by the experience but also to share them with others, to interpret them and testify to them and expand the inclusive fellowship of the community of faith. It's a really important uh, point that the writer makes. He goes on to talk about his experience of God as light and, and Jesus helping liberate him from sin and the fact that he had to come to grips with his own need for grace in order to receive the grace that Jesus offers and understanding the suffering and work of Christ as a sacrifice that paves the way for God's grace to enter his life. And he's testifying to that to others because he wants his joy to be complete by the expansion of the fellowship of folks with similar experience to others. That being said, in a few moments, we're going to share the sacrament of the Lord's Supper here at the, at the table. And y'all heard Pastor Raquel say early in the service, this is an open table. It's a table that is welcoming and open and shared with anyone who's able to come. Why is that? Because this, while it is an ancient tradition and liturgy and ritual of the church, is also a shared experience. And it's a shared experience that takes place within a gospel context in which we understand that the elements that we're sharing, while simple juice, bread shared among us, make present to us the very body and blood of Christ who gave his life for us and integrate us into the greater life of the church as we are the body of Christ that's redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so our communion is open as a shared experience. Why? 
so that our joy can be complete and so that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship be with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All of these things are exciting to me. I don't know how they are to you. I, um, I don't think I would want to devote my life to ministry or to the gospel or to Christ if God weren't this type of living God that's always around showing up and in, in experience and surprising me and waking me up and reminding me that, that there's always something new. There's always some surprise. There's always something fresh and awakening to us. As you go from here later today and tomorrow gather with loved ones to look at the, the beauty of the celestial order. Hopefully it's not so cloudy. Lord, hear us. We want to have some clear skies in Texas, you know. The eyes of Texas want to be upon you, Lord, and on the skies. Uh, we want to see it. Uh, but um, remember this experience for all of your life. But also remember the beauty of God's glory that surpasses anything you're going to see up there in the eclipse. Um, the Lord is, is, a, is a living God. Christ is risen and wants us to experience him in the fullness of faith and communion with him in our daily and, and life together in our walk with him. Amen. We have a word of greeting of uh, Sister Blanca Cantu's watching us. I suppose that's from New York. Um, I think they get the eclipse too up there, right? It kind of cuts across up in the northeast. They'll get it before, sort of, but maybe before we do. So, hi, Blanca. Uh, also, prayers uh, of concern today for Juanita Lozoya, who's recovering from uh, injury, and also for Orion, who's uh, in need of healing grace. Are there other prayer concerns to lift up today that we'll pray over before we enter into the sacrament? Yes. An uncle and aunt of Gonzalez. Mm. For healing grace. Michelle? <laughs> 22 years old, Aubrey, in need of healing and deliverance from a chronic illness. Uh, yes. Tomorrow's 94, Rosie, and you're here with us. Praise the Lord. Yes. Oh, wow. Both on the same day. My goodness. I see. Yes, Henry. Henry. Grace, Grace, and thanks for that life. Mm. And for the family, for consolation and friends and co-workers in the, in the struggle. Yes, up in the balcony. Nathaniel's birthday last week. Nathaniel's up there working our sound system today. Nathaniel Rodriguez, God bless you. Happy birthday. All right. Any others looking around? Let's join in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the gift of life. We've heard that today you are a living God, and we experience that truth uh, every time your grace is imparted to us, every time we see your hand at work, every time we look upon the beauty of your creation. We know that, that you are a living God, and you impart your life to us. We thank you for those who are celebrating and have celebrated birthdays, and what a beautiful experience to to be here today knowing lord that you are faithful and you are good we lift up to you today prayers for those who are ill who are recovering from illness or injury who are at home who are isolated um, lord who those who are traveling and are in need of of your guide protection this weekend and all the the many people that will be crowding together in small towns uh, not far from here and we pray for those who who provides services for them. Uh, Lord, we pray today um, for peace in our world. Uh, we remember, Lord, as even as we share in the joy of your presence and the beauty of this holy place of worship, that there are places in the world today where 
where your children are in rubble and dust and ruin and death all surrounds them. And we ask, Lord God, for a cessation of violence in the world and the restoration of peace and the reconciliation of nations to one another in peace. All of these things we pray in Christ's name as we prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls to receive the gift of your Holy Eucharist. Amen. I invite you to turn to page 13 in the red hymnal for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. glory. Hosanna in, in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Will those who are helping with communion please come forward at this time? And uh, you will receive a wafer with the words, the body of Christ given for you. And then you will receive an individual cup with the words, the blood of Christ given for you. And again, everyone is welcome to the table of the Lord. This is an open table.
us now say the prayer after receiving. That's in the bulletin. Lord, we bless and praise you for nourishing us with this Easter feast of redemption. Fill us with your spirit and make us living signs of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The closing hymn is Christ is Alive, number 318 in the red hymnal. You may stand. Thank you for participating in worship today. And as a reminder, uh, you're welcome to take your lilies home with you today. Thank you for, um, for gifting those to, for the Easter season. Brothers and sisters, go forth in peace and may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the communion of God's Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. <laughs>